On the 8th of July 1943, Harold Christie, a Bahamian property developer, was a guest of his friend Sir Harold Oakes's mansion on the island of New Providence in the Bahamas, whilst the latter's wife stayed at the family's summer house at Bar Harbour in Maine, while the rest of the family were travelling in the United States. He was due to meet his host, aged 68, for breakfast. Normally, he would find him downstairs in the dining room, and due to his absence, went to Oak's bedroom to wake him up. He was horrified to discover the dead body of his best friend and business partner. It was a grim scene. Oakes's face was covered in blood, feathers from a pillow were scattered over his body, and there were bloodstains on the Chinese screen and bloody footprints on the floor. A flammable liquid had been poured on the crime scene to set it ablaze, but the flames had been extinguished by the strong breeze of the previous night that came through the open windows. A doctor was summoned who pronounced Harold dead. He had been murdered, but by whom? This is Finch's murders and the brutal slaying of the tax exile. Oakes was born on the 23rd of December 1893. He was neither from the Bahamas or the United Kingdom, but originally an American from Sangerville in Maine, who dropped out of medical school at Syracuse University after two years to try his luck in the Alaska gold boom of 1898. Unfortunately for him, he did not make his fortune, and for the next 15 years he wandered around the world, travelling from Canada to Alaska, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, and finally back to Canada. Apart from being a miner, he worked as a technician in a hospital and even briefly owned a flax farm in New Zealand. But gold was his first love. In 1912, he came to Kirkland Lake in Upper Ontario and first developed an iron ore mine. He then ventured out on his own and staked claim number T. 16633 at the lake, which he named Lakeshore Mine. It grew into the second biggest gold mine in Canada. However, the actual mine did not produce any gold until 1918, and Oaks for many years had to issue shares to develop it. A person who invested four cents at the beginning would eventually be sitting on a profitable $64 per share. By the time of his death, he was one of the richest men in the world, with a reputed fortune of 200 million. It is said that he was not a particularly pleasant character, having abandoned his pregnant wife in Australia for his quest for gold. He was a capricious boss, sacking managers at will. He even bankrupted a local store near the gold mine that had pointedly refused him credit. He certainly was a man not to cross. One time, he was made to sit at the back of the restaurant at the British Colonia Hotel in the Bahamas because of his shabby clothes. He bought the hotel and sacked the maitre d'. He insisted that black Bahamians work there and set up training for those lacking the necessary skills. He also gave generously to local charities and was awarded a knighthood for this. He had resided in Canada, but resented paying the local taxes. By 1935, the cash-strapped Canadian government was charging him $3 million per year. At one point, he toyed with the idea of entering the Parliament in Canada, but was blocked by the then Prime Minister. He was persuaded by his friend Harold Christie, a Bahamian, to settle on the island for tax reasons and so became one of the first tax exiles. In 1923, Oakes, who by then was 50, met 28-year-old Eunice on a cruise to South Africa and married her. They wintered in the Bahamas and spent the summers at Bar Harbour in Maine. 
The location had been a fashionable Victorian retreat, but by now had seen better days. The Bahamas is an archipelago 50 miles from Florida. In the 1940s, it comprised 70,000 inhabitants, of whom three quarters were of African descent. It had enjoyed a brief boom during Prohibition, as it was used to smuggle rum and whiskey. The famous whiskey, Cutty Sark, was blended especially for the Bahamas market, which in turn would be shipped to the United States in violation of Prohibition laws. But by the 1940s, it was impoverished again. But a certain section of the population were definitely not poor, as a small white elite owned 70% of the islands, as well as controlling it politically. They became known as the Bay Street Boys. Like many men of his type, Oakes decided to invest in his new island home and bought a local hotel, built a country club and golf course, as well as a small airline. But he endeared himself to the native Bahamians by giving free transportation to his employees, milk to the local children, and built a new wing for the local hospital. During the war, the Bay Street Boys were joined by a mishmash of characters, largely gaining out of Europe for the duration of the conflict. It ranged from a former king of the British Empire, now called the Duke of Windsor, to a Swedish industrialist called Weimar Green, who founded Electrolux, and an American prohibition gangster called Paul Marshall. After the body had been discovered, Harold Christie called the police who in turn contacted the governor of the Bahamas, who was the Duke of Windsor. He immediately ordered a press embargo on the story. Unfortunately, Christie had agreed to meet with the journalist Etienne Depeche that day to discuss the purchase of sheep. Depeche could not believe his luck at the news of Oakes's death and sent the story to Associated Press, who in turn sent it around the world. Instead of placing stories on the progress of the war, the media concentrated on this story. Journalists from around the United States descended on the Bahamas to cover this tragedy. But what was the Duke of Windsor doing in a backwater like 1940s Bahamas? After he abducted as a result of his association with Wallace Simpson, they travelled across Europe, eventually reaching Germany where they were received by Adolf Hitler, and where the Duke was pictured making the Nazi salute. Appeasement was the official government policy, and even an English football team made the same salute. It was his behaviour during the war that drew concern. He was in Paris at the time of the French surrender, and instead of trying to get back to the British Empire, the couple went to the south of France, and hence to Spain, and then to Portugal. The British establishment were worried that he would be lured back to Spain, and then kidnapped back to Berlin. He was ordered back home, and dispatched to a place where he could do little harm, the Bahamas. It was there that he was to become the governor. In those days it was not a figurehead role, but a person of real local power. At first... The Duke thought Oak's death was caused by an accident, as the victim had been seen going around his estate bulldozing trees. After it was confirmed it was murder, the Duke telegraphed the colonial office in London and said he was asking the Miami police to send two detectives to the Bahamas and specified an Edward Melchin, who had been his bodyguard in the past. Melchin was joined by a fingerprint specialist called James Barker. When the two arrived in the Bahamas, they were horrified to discover that the crime scene was being scrubbed clean by the police after tourists had visited the site to collect mementos. But the Bahamian police were not the only ones to be sloppy in their work. The Miami duo had forgotten to take a latent fingerprint camera with them. On the first day, they could not take prints due to the local humidity. As Miami suffers from roughly the same climate, 
it all seems slightly strange. A list of potential suspects was drawn up, and at the top of it was Harold Christie, who had spent the night at the mansion within the Bougainvillea Adore Nassau estate. He claimed that he had slept through the night and heard nothing due to the loud thunderstorm. But his testimony had holes in it. Why was his car parked far away from the mansion? In addition, a witness said he spotted his vehicle in the middle of Nassau, and possibly because it was raining heavily, he could not positively identify Christie as the driver. More promising was Alfred de Marigny, whose real name was Alfred Forquero. He referred to himself as a count through his mother's side. He was a twice-divorced Mauritian playboy, who was an excellent sailor and commanded a yacht with the rather interesting name of the Concubine. He was certainly not one of the Bay Street boys, and there were rumours on the island that he would drug young women before assaulting them. More importantly, he had courted and married Nancy Oakes in the Bronx, New York, just before her 18th birthday, and without her parents' permission. Lady Oakes fainted on hearing the news. A year later, Nancy became pregnant, and her parents persuaded her to have an abortion in Mexico. It was known that he had quarrelled with his father-in-law on a number of occasions. Unsurprisingly, he was invited in for questioning. During his interrogation by Edward Melchin and James Barker, he was given a glass of water and a packet of cigarettes. The Duke of Windsor unexpectedly appeared and spent time conferring alone with Melchin. The chief of police declined to charge the suspect, and consequently the Duke of Windsor transferred him to a post in Trinidad. This left the Miami detectives to question Don Meringue and take the necessary evidence. Despite the upheaval caused by a Bahamian approach to taking evidence, they were able to locate his fingerprint on the Chinese screen and under further inspection was found to have singes on his beard and burn marks on his forearm. De Meringue was arrested and charged with the murder. His wife did not believe that her husband was capable of such a dastardly act and hired a private detective, Raymond Scheidler, to investigate the case. The local authorities made sure he was followed and his phone was tapped. He never named a suspect, but he discovered a few things of interest. First, witnesses had seen Harold Christie around midnight in a vehicle in Nassau. Also nearby, a boat had dropped two unidentified people off and picked them up later in the early morning. The witness, who was an experienced diver, was never called to the trial, as he had recently mysteriously drowned out at sea. There is a New England Historical Society article on the murder of Harry Oakes, and if it is correct, then he was certainly the victim of some kind of stitch-up. Detectives Melchin and Barker met up with Lady Oakes at her summer residence in Bar Harbour on the 16th of July, and told her of the discovery of the fingerprint. At the trial, they put the date of the discovery of this evidence as being the 19th of July. But things were not looking good for the Mauritian playboy, as potentially he faced the death penalty. Oddly, as it happens, the authorities had ordered a new rope in the event of a guilty verdict. The trial began on the 13th of October 1943, and the governor and his wife decided to stay in the United States for the duration of the proceedings. Accordingly, and perhaps conveniently, he could not be called as a witness. De Meringue was able to prove that he was at a dinner party for most of the evening, but there was a 30-minute period 
in which he could not show corroborating evidence. But he was able to produce a witness who vouched that he was with him at the time of the murder. He said the burns were caused by his efforts in lighting a candle. But help was at hand, as the two Miami detectives were called as witnesses, and their performance was woeful. They disagreed on the date when James Barker found the incriminating fingerprint. Melchin said that the victim staggered out of bed, but forensic evidence proved that Sir Harry Oakes had been in bed all the time. Let us return to the fingerprint. James Barker could not remember where he had found it on the silk screen. Fingerprint analysis had shown it was too perfect to be capable of attaching itself to the fabric on the screen. It was suggested by the defence that the fingerprint either came from the glass or the cigarette pack when the suspect was being interviewed. After over two hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty, but recommended that the defendant be deported. The governor agreed, and described a Meringue as an unscrupulous adventurer with an evil reputation for immoral conduct. He left for Cuba the next day and started partying with the likes of Ernest Hemingway. Nancy and Freddie had divorced just after the war. Later she had a daughter with the Hollywood screen idol Richard Green. Years later, de Meringue was asked about the case. He spoke of two men being seen by a witness in a car with Harold Christie at the time of the murder. Another, the diver, who later drowned, had described seeing the two leave the island on a boat. If de Meringue was innocent, then who was responsible for this murder? Given that the Bahamas had, and some still say has, a seedy reputation, then there were plenty of potential suspects. Even today, its murder rate is not as bad as San Salvador or Honduras, but unfortunately is still high, and it is a major smuggling route for drug traffickers. There are three main conspiracy theories concerning this case. The first is that Harry Oakes was part of some ring of money launderers that was using a Swedish industrialist yacht to funnel illicit money out of the Bahamas to Banco Continental in Mexico. The only bank of that name in South America is in Peru and was founded in 1951. This is not to say that Banco Commercial of Mexico did not exist in 1943, in some form or another. This team of rogues included the victim, Harold Christie, the Duke of Windsor, and Wima Green, the Swedish industrialist. After the reading of the will, Harry Oakes' estate was valued at only £20 million, instead of the reputed £200 million and the children would only get a thousand pounds a month each until the age of thirty. This leads on to the second hypothesis that Oakes was murdered by a group of Nazi sympathizers, including the Duke and Wima Green. The latter was known to be a friend of Goering and was suspected of using his yacht to supply U boats. The FBI were keeping an eye on suspected Nazi sympathizers. They were certainly watching the Windsors and suspected that the clothes sent to New York for dry cleaning contained secret messages for Berlin. The third suggestion is that a group of American mobsters were using the services of local businessman Paul Marshall in conjunction with the Duke of Windsor and Harold Christie to develop local casinos but there is no evidence that Oakes was opposed to the development of local casinos and hotels for tourists. Cuba was the playground for the Mafia, not the Bahamas. A fourth possibility that has been dismissed is that it was part of a voodoo ritual because of the feathers which just came from a pillow. But this misses the point. Voodoo is part of West Indian culture and could be used to silence witnesses. But why kill a man 
who was liked by the local populace. Violent nationalism was breaking out in many parts of the British Empire. From riots in the Raj, the activities of the Stern Gang in Palestine, to the beginning of the Mau Mau in Kenya. Harry Oakes, to nationalists, would be seen as a symbol of British rule, despite his efforts to help the locals. These types of conspiracy theories are a dream come true to Hollywood types. Nazis, Duke of Windsor, old-style gangsters, money laundering and playboy types. Alternatively, it could have been a local lad who had been sacked, got stoned on ganja and drink, climbed up the outside of the house, breaks in and stabs the man to death in the middle of a thunderstorm. So, why was the Duke of Windsor so obsessed with the case? He had gone from king to a royal outcast. He was stuck in a colonial backwater of an outpost in which he was expected to do nothing. He comes to the Bahamas and Harry Oakes generously allows him to use his mansion whilst the governor's residence was being refurbished. At long last, a friend he could trust, and now that ally was dead. In 1985, the novelist Andrew Boyd was invited to a private party in Lyford Quay, which had just been developed into a huge resort by Harold Christie. He recalls that he was approached by a burly man with two servants who wanted to know whether he was the one asking questions about the murder of Harry Oakes. If he continued this course of action, he was informed, he was to leave the party. Boyd reported this in The Guardian, but does not mention the identity of the man in question. To this day, this case is still a mystery, and nobody has come forward with any fresh information or to confess to the crime. It has been many years since that dreadful night. Is there still time for a deathbed confession? We may never know.